Welcome back, everybody. Uh, good to see you. Let's see how we're doing here. Um, I had a couple of corrections from last time. Um, first of all, I want to just, uh, there was some confusion towards the end of the day when people were starting to um, get their uh, teeth into the notebooks. And they wound up noticing that sometimes you could download the notebook and then you'd bring it up and then it just wouldn't even render at all um, inside of your web browser. That's because um, there was a version change from uh, version two of the notebook to version three of the notebook as IPython itself went from 0.12 to 0.13. Unfortunately, the latest EPD distribution is 0.12. So the vast majority of you, I think, are using um, what you might call an old version of um, the notebook. The new versions of the notebook will be able to read the old versions, but the old versions don't know how to read the new versions. So accidentally, we posted a couple version threes and not version twos of the notebook. So if you're having trouble, it's not you. We just posted the wrong version. Um, what we're going to try to be diligent about, and, and you see Eric did this already for the, um, uh, for the solutions, is to post two different versions of the notebook. If you're using the latest IPython 0.13 uh, or 0.14, you're fine to pull up either of those. If you're using the EPD distribution, make sure you get your hands on the version two, okay? Um, and if you find out that we haven't posted the right one, just let us know. The other one is I impugned the state of Kansas yesterday, and I apologize for that. I got an email from the governor, um, and, and you as well. Um, it was actually Indiana that tried to pass the Pi bill. And it wasn't 3.0 that they tried to say Pi was, they said it was 3.2. It almost passed. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize, everyone from Kansas, but now I'm looking at you and yeah. Um, okay, so here's the plan of action uh, for today. Um, we uh, are already a couple minutes behind. We'll try to catch up a bit. We're going to talk about strings. In some sense, we kind of powered through some of the real basics of the Python language yesterday. And, um, we're, and then we got into some interesting stuff like plotting, and these are considered sort of outside of the, um, of the built-in core language. We're going to come back into the core language um, in the morning and really spend most of the day sort of teaching you some of the more advanced concepts that exist within um, Python. And then uh, tomorrow we'll get back into some of the more advanced stuff that lives sort of outside of the core language. So this morning we're going to do advanced strings and file I.O. Um, we'll do uh, some advanced stuff, um, just sort of a, a grouping of things that we think you should know um, that weren't in any of the other modules before um, we do the first uh, introduction to object-oriented programming. Then we'll have a lunch and a breakout. We'll do another um, incarnation of object-oriented programming, getting into the, some of the nitty-gritty of that. And then we'll end the day with some software carpentry, a discussion of um, development of your code, versioning of your code, and curation of your code using the thing that we all use, which is called um, Git. OK, so let's uh, jump right into it. Um, strings can uh, do operations on themselves. You've already started to see this concept of a method, um, but now we're going to see what strings know how to do on themselves. So if I have um, a couple of different methods on strings, one's called lower, another upper, another capitalized. Um, Funky Town, you see I spelled that, uh, or at least capitalized that in a weird, weird way. Um, you can say dot capitalize, and you get Funky Town. Um, here I have another Funky Town. I can put it all the lowercase. I can split up strings very nicely and elegantly. If I just say Funky Town and I say dot split, it splits on something. There's a default. There's a character that it splits on. It's basically, um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a space. So every time there's a space in your string, um, it will split there. And what did it return? What, what type of object did it return back to us? A list. And a list, or an array. But it is, it is technically a list. So I could iterate over that list if I needed to. Um, you can daisy chain these methods, right, because the result of having returned capitalize is a string. And so I can, if you want to think about it this way, what's happening is you've got um, the result of what's ever happening inside here, then getting returned into a new string, which is then getting split up. You can use um, the list comprehension that we introduced yesterday uh, to go through and 
perhaps sequentially capitalize each one of these. Um, so if you notice, if I said funkytown.split.capitalize, the result of funkytown.split is a list. .capitalize is not a method of a list, and so that would fail. So if I really want to capitalize each one of those letters, uh, each one of those words in turn, one way to do it would be to start off with the string, split it up, and the result of that is a list. We iterate over that list, and as we step through each element in that list, we get uh, we basically fill up this variable called x, and then um, we wind up uh, running the capitalize method on that, and then you wind up getting um, uh, you wind up getting a new list that comes back. We've capitalized um, each of the words in turn. I want to take you to Funky Town, and now I don't want to split it on all the spaces. I want to split it on something else. I want to split it on U. And so what you wind up seeing is every time there's the letter U, you wind up uh, removing that and splitting on that. So now I've got the, I want to take yo to F town. Um, what if I want to split on not just an individual character, I want to split on a, on a string. I can do that as well. And it says I want to take, and then you notice that it's preserving that space right there to funky town. Yeah. yeah. Can you split on the character that, I mean, can you keep the character you split on? Um, no, you can, you, you can figure out sort of very succinct ways of pushing it back on um, when you actually, if you want to say rejoin the strings or something. Uh, but no, effectively what you're doing is saying use that to cut stuff. And you can imagine why this might be helpful, say, if you're parsing through a CSV file and you didn't know about CSV to rec, you could go line by line and say split on commas. Or if you know that your CSV file is tab separated, you could say split on slash t. Um, and here we go. So here's a CSV string. Um, dog, cat, spam, defenestrate, one, 3.14, and then some other stuff at the end. Um, so we can say CSV string dot strip. And what does strip do? That's something new. That just removes all the trailing and leading white spaces in a string. So that's kind of nice if you want to clean up um, individual strings. Now let's say I want to clean up that list a little bit, um, and I want to make, um, uh, I basically want to make sure that I don't have extra spaces after I do my cut. Um, and so I have my clean list, and what have I done? I've taken CSV string, um, I've split that on the comma, and then um, I will wind up iterating over that and making a new list. What does clean list look like? It looks probably something similar to what we want. Right, so now you can deal with each of the elements of this. So, you know, the, one way to think about you parsing foreign data is that you have to be pretty robust against all the little quirkiness um, of, of that data. And so, this is actually pretty easy after you've played around with a couple, um, you know, lines of a, of a piece of data, you'll wind up realizing, oh, there's all this stuff at the end, I don't really need that, I can get rid of that. They've added all these extra white spaces, which isn't really nice. Um, and so, um, you know, this is part of you getting familiar with the data sets that you're playing with. This is mostly in kind of reading stuff in. Um, there's similar kinds of things you do when you write stuff out. In particular, there's something called join um, that allows you to glue a list of strings together with a certain string. So now I've cleaned up uh, that one line of, um, of uh, CSV, and I want to do something with that. Let's say I want to write back out a cleaner version of, a, of that CSV line. So what you can do is you can say, here is some string, and join it, uh, basically use that to um, essentially act as glue between all the elements in this list right here. So it's, it's almost identically opposite of split. Here you basically say what character you want to use to uh, do that glue, and split you basically can say what character you want to do to do the split. And here you go, a nice cleaned up version of that, um, of that CSV line. Yes? Can you include spaces in there? So in where? I need commas and spaces. Yeah, if you wanted commas and spaces, you could do that. If you wanted to separate everything with a slash n to have everything on a new line, you could do that. You could put anything you want there. You could also have that be an empty string, so you just concatenate all the, um, all the elements together. What do you think the uh, nature or the type of the different elements have to be inside of clean list for this to work? String. 
What if you weren't sure if clean list had uh, only strings in it? How could you sort of, without having to write a new array and stuff like that, how could you deal with that? Someone raising. Yeah, there. What's that? STR, but how, what does it mean to do an STR on a list? So close. Yep, you would do a list comprehension, right? You'd say, um, you know, bracket uh, STR of X for X in, in list, right? Close bracket. You could just shove that in here um, to make sure that you're, you're definitely getting a string. So here's a, a way if we instead don't want to do comma separated output, we want to do tab separated output with a backslash T. Um, we can also go into strings and we can replace stuff within them. By the way, remember I said yesterday that strings were mutable. That is still the case. What's happening when we're replacing characters and things within strings? Well, Python's saying, oh, you want me to replace this with that? Fine, I'll do that for you. I'm just going to return to you a new string. So you're not actually going in like you do within a mutable object like, um, like a list. You're not actually going in and in line essentially changing that uh, element in that list. You're actually creating a new, uh, a new string. So dot replace is a method that works on uh, strings. And here I want to, here's my CSV string. And I want to, what am I going to do here? I'm going to strip all the bad stuff off the back over here and there's nothing up over the front. And I want to replace all the spaces with a comma. So I pretty much got back what I did in the few lines above it, but in a very different way. Are there any questions about that? No. Yes? Actually, you're replacing the spaces with a no space. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. I, I, yes, correct. I'm replacing spaces with no space. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, and here I'm replacing the no spaces with a, uh, sorry, the spaces with a no space, and I'm replacing the commas with a backslash T. So that gives me my tab separated version of that. Everyone clear what's happening here? Sort of daisy chaining these methods. Should be clear what's sort of the ordering of this as well. Okay. Um, we can do some introspection inside. Of, uh, of, of those um, strings and find, as you'll see, or find, is incredibly useful for searching. What you get is an index of um, the result of that search. So if I have a string called my funny valentine and I ask for where is um, the character uh, y, I get the number one because s is zero index, so m is uh, the zeroth place and y is at the first place. And again, you notice, um, just like when we were doing a list yesterday, that if you ask for the index of an element whose value is something, you don't get back all of them, you get back just the first one. Um, S dot find uh, y comma 2, what's happening here? Well, what it's saying is start your search at index 2. So for instance, if you absolutely needed to loop over every, every single string, there's obviously sort of um, nice packages that do stuff like this for you. But if you had to really, really go into every single string and look for certain characters or certain, um, certain uh, snippets of, of string in there, um, one way you could do this is basically start at zero index and just start looping through your string. Find the first uh, instance of that, perhaps save that index, and then start at the next value. In this case, I, started, I had one, and I start now at two. I start my search at two. And you just keep on going until you get to the end of the string, right? If you really need to do something like that. Um, OK, what is this doing? Well, think about the ordering in which this operation is happening. S.findFunny, that's going to find the index where the word funny starts. So it's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3. So 3 is going to be replaced here. And then I have the colon, and then I have nothing after that. So I'm going to start at index 3, and I'm going to get everything after that. And I'm going to just return that, that part of that string. And we, what happens when I say Z? There is no Z in, in Funny Valentine. Anyone have a guess? Minus 1. 
This is one of the quirks of Python. It could have said none. They could have made that decision. But instead, they decided minus one. So typically, what you'll wind up seeing in code is that if you're trying to find, let's say you're, you want to know whether the line that you're looking at is a comment line, you'll say, uh, and, and you know you want to loop through all the comment lines. You don't want to have to deal with them. You might say, while the string that I'm reading um, dot find, and then you know whatever the comment, let's say it's a hashtag, uh, is not equal to uh, not equal to negative one. Keep on going. Yeah. That's a weird choice because that happens to be the index of the last character also. Oh right, yes. Yeah. So if you want to now use that and you say, you know, let me grab the result of that search and and see what character that is, you're absolutely right that that would be wrong. Um, so it is uh, it is a weird choice. Does everyone get that right? So if I have a string. Did we also find out yesterday? You can go backwards in a string. So here's um, here's a string, and now if I say the index is um, a find z, that's negative one. But if I say a of i, I get y. So this is what you're pointing out is weird. So you have to be a little bit careful about what you get back and find. So then if you put a requirement saying, you said like if, if you could put something saying, you know, move over on left, it's say negative one, then it's also going to miss that last letter. Isn't say that again? You said in code you could put like, you could put that you don't want to continue the code if the index equals whatever find Z. So then it's going to miss the last letter. Uh, no, 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 because the last letter also has also has a meaning. So if I go to, um, if I say the length of A, right, is 5, and if I say um, A4, I get Y. So if I searched for, um, if I searched for uh, Y, I'd get 4. I wouldn't get minus 1. There's just something special about the minus one, right? The minus one makes it painful if you want to just use the result without actually knowing what that result is. Um, yeah. Was there a question over there? Okay. Can you use um, a string in double quotes and object? Can you use the method? Yeah, so the question is can you use strings or double quotes? And the answer is and, and use methods on them. So if I just said, Hello, and then I could say split on hello, because I'm cockney. That just works. Right? It doesn't have to be a variable. Is that what you're asking? Okay. Okay, so now we have a, um, a list of strings, and the first element of that list is my funny Valentine, next is Argentine, American. Quarantine. Um, now we'll loop over that list for the string in SS. If the string finds time not equal to minus one, that is, it's in there, print uh, basically the string um, contains time. My funny Valentine contains time, Argentine contains time, quarantine, quarantine contains time. Um, you try to say that at home. Uh, so what are we missing out here? We're missing, we're missing the American because as I loop through these strings, I wind up asking the question, is um, the occurrence of time inside of that string, um, if it is not, I will get back a negative one. So this is sort of an example, a very succinct example of um, how you would use the find to sort of loop through all of your different strings. There's also some useful variables and functions. So if I say import string, I get access to some nice um, uh, functions. So these are not necessarily methods on a string object, but these are functions. I can swap case. So I've got a lowercase f and a lowercase t, and I just want to switch that around. And I get back what we did at the very beginning. Um, I've got uh, access to all the ASCII letters. So if you're looping through and I say, is this an ASCII letter that you just gave me? You can just say, is this, um, is this uh, character um, in the ASCII letters, and that's basically just a very long string. I can get digits, so I say, is this character a digit? 
that kind of stuff. Okay, um, we're going to look at um, this thing called uh, check email now, which is going to um, allow us to parse through a couple of different uh, uh, emails. And all this is going to wind up doing is just looking at an email address and tell us whether this is a valid email address or not. Okay. So um, I think this is, if you reload the agenda, this should be up there right now. Um, you can pull this over and you can play around with it. Let's just um, take a look at it. So um, at the top, I'm importing string because I'm going to need some access to that. Um, here are the domains that I'm going to allow myself to have um, at the very end of my email. And um, there's some uh, disallowed um, characters because I know about this in, in uh, emails, you're not allowed to have a dot and, um, sorry, uh, you are allowed to have a dot, um, but all the other things that are punctuation um, are not usually, or not generally allowed in email. What does it mean to be punctuation? Let's just check that out, forgot. That looks like Charlie Brown, speaking of Lucy. Um, so all that stuff isn't allowed. We're gonna, we're gonna handle the at sign gracefully. But um, what you see I did here, uh, where I wound up replacing the dot with the empty string, I basically said, I, like, I don't wanna know about any of these things in my email address, but I will replace um, the dot with the empty string, which is just saying it's okay to have that dot. And you notice that somewhere in the middle, around there, the dot is now gone. Um, okay, I'm going to loop through, and um, I'm going to ask for uh, an email address. Um, this won't work in the notebook, of course, because you they don't know how to do uh, 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 standard in yet. I'll strip out whatever I get at the end just to make sure if the person added like a um, some escape character or in pressing return, it actually made its way into the string that I got back. Um, I'm going to count the total numbers of at signs, and as you know, there should be only one of those. If it's not equal to one, I'm basically going to say, uh-uh, sorry, you have to have one at sign. And then what does the continue do? It just says, forget about all this other stuff, just go back to the top. And it, what's that going to do? It's just going to ask for another one. Um, user name and domain. This is where I will now use the split, uh, split method on that string, and I'll split on the at sign. So now I've got everything on the username side and everything on the domain side. First, we look at the domain side. We're going to look for a dot. Um, if there is not a dot in there, there has to be at least one dot. So you can't just have, a, you know, Josh at Berkeley. It's got to be Josh at Berkeley.edu. Um, you have to have at least one dot. If that's not there, uh, then we have to um, uh, return back. What else are we going to look for? We're going to make sure that the last part of this is um, the correct domain. So are we allowing dot coms? Yes, we're allowing dot coms. It's fine. So um, let's say I've got uh, Josh at Microsoft.com. I'm going to split on that um, and on this dot, and I'm going to take the last element of that. So that's the last, whatever the last characters are after the last dot. You notice here there could be multiple dots, but I'm saying I don't really know or care how many of those dots are in the domain name. I'm just going to look at the last um, bit of that. Uh, okay. So if it's not in there, so what, how do I ask that question? If it's not in the allowed domain names, it's really got to be in there, then I say, uh-uh. So we're good to go, um, and you'll see why we need this later on, um, because I want to catch all the errors that could happen in the username. Um, so if we've got disallowed characters, basically here's the disallowed string. That's the thing that we constructed at the very top. I want to say, no, we're not allowed to do this. But we're continuing because we actually want to catch some other errors if there are any others. We're here, then we're in a good domain, um, and uh, we want to now check the username and make sure it doesn't have any invalid characters. And then if we're good to go, we say we've got a valid email and we're done. So we're making use of a bunch of the different concepts I've already showed you this morning and um, this construct of the while loop that we had before. By the way, you notice I don't have any doc strings in the previous one. That's bad. I should have, have doc strings. So, um, you know, do as I say, not as I do. We try to put as many doc strings as we can, but just to put it all on, on the screen so we can read an entire code on, in one, one go, uh, sometimes we leave some of that stuff out. Okay. Um, 
All right, so let's play around with the check email address. You can try this. Uh, type python check email .py within, um, uh, basically within one of your terminals. You can also, I believe, type run check email .py within IPython. Not with an IPython notebook, but with an IPython. So let me try a bad email, josh.python.org. There are no at signs. So it goes right back to the top. Here we've got our at sign, but we don't have any dots. So that's an invalid domain name. Here, Josh rocks at python comma dot org. And I've got I've caught all the bad characters. Josh rocks at python.org. Valid email, thank you. Um, okay, any questions about sort of parsing strings? Looking inside of strings, dealing with what you find? Okay. So we'll talk about string formatting. Um, yesterday we gave you a breakout session where we asked you to sort of make nice column formatted um, uh, outputs from this uh, airport example. And uh, we didn't really give you all the tools that Python has to do this stuff fairly gracefully. Um, there you had to basically coerce it and, and count the number of characters in the input string and then pad out the res uh, all the sort of extra missing space with actual spaces. Um, so there's uh, nice ways to do formatting just like you get in Fortran or C. Um, and the uh, typical usage that you wind up seeing, oh this is changing a little bit, is you have quotes, could be a single quote or a double quote, and then you have a percent sign, you have something about the format, and then afterwards you have a um, you have another uh, percent sign, and then actually a tuple. Um, so it's a variable, comma variable, comma variable. So I'll show you examples of this. Uh, so my favorite integer is um, this percent sign i. That's obviously not an integer, so that's telling Python when you're parsing this. Um, this is something special. You're going to have to fill this up with something else, as you'll see later on. And my favorite float is, um, now here's this uh, f, percent sign f, let's say print it as a float, which the three decimal places is dot 3f. And in exponent form is um, whatever, percent sign e. So my favorite integer is 3. Uh, my favorite float is math.py, math.py, math.py. Python will do its best to basically coerce um, the, uh, the results of this output for you um, as, as makes sense. My favorite integer is three, my favorite float is this, and there is a default for how many in a float get printed out after the decimal place, which to three decimal places is 3.142, and in exponential form is 3.14 blah blah blah, e, et cetera. Um, what are some things that uh, that you notice about how this got printed out? It actually rounded for us. Right? So Python says, okay, when you're printing out a number that's a float, or you're printing out a number um, that uh, is an ex uh, in exponential notation, um, and you're saying, just show me the first three <coughs> decimal places, it says, well, you don't just want to see those as they would be represented if I sort of rendered the whole float made it as a string and then just cut it off. It actually says, oh, what you really want to do is you want to show this as best as you can and therefore it's doing the rounding. So this very succinctly shows you the different ways in which you can get access to different types of formatting. Um, if I had said math.py uh, math instead of the three here, what do you think would happen? I actually don't remember, so I'm going to do it. Um, what if it was, uh, what is math.e? Right, it didn't do the rounding for us. At least it didn't, at least it didn't round up for us. Um, so when you do this integer printing, you gotta be very careful, right? I believe when you do integers, it always does the floor of the integer. But when you're asking to render a float, 
and you're asking it just to show a certain number of decimal places, then um, uh, it does what you think it should do. Any questions about that? We're not going to have time to go into all the different types of formatting. I'm just trying to scratch the surface here to show you that you can do these things, and it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, I have a link at the bottom. You can replace the 2.7.2 with 2.7.3. It's basically the same. It hasn't changed much. Um, OK, if you actually do want to have a percent sign inside of your string, you have to tell Python, uh, by the way, um, this is not a special character anymore. And the way you do that is you wind up giving it a double percent sign. So I promise to give you 100% effort whenever uh, it's asked of percent sign s. Now s is a string. We can do uh, zero padding. Um, and uh, you see I have a, basically a bunch of different ways to do this. You can use this uh, as a reference point. Um, we have a percent sign f, so that's just saying show me the float, um, backslash n, so I'm going to get a new line. Uh, then I've got a percent sign Sorry, then I've got a percent sign plus f. We'll see what happens there. And then a percent sign plus f backslash n, 0, 1, 0, f. You'll see all these different types of format. And we can try to figure out what it's actually doing for us. All right, let's start from the back, actually. Here's 10s. What do you think that's doing? It's printing out the, the word pi. It's just padding, right? It's making sure that there are 10 characters as what appears um, on this line. Um, what's the next one doing up here? This is doing some padding as well, um, making sure that we've got 10 spaces and it's zero padded out. So it prints it in this funny way. Very rarely would you need to print it that way. Um, let's see, I had a minus sign right here. Um, and you can see that if I have a minus sign, I basically will always show, uh, using this plus, the minus sign. But if you don't have a minus sign through this first um, incarnation of the percent sign f, um, you don't see the plus sign. But let's say you really do want to see the plus sign, that plus says, OK, I'm always going to show you whether it's positive or negative. Um, OK, so that's one way to do string formatting. The other way, which is sort of the Python 3 way, so it's not a bad way to learn now, and it works just natively in, in Python 2.7, um, is where you kind of, this kind of looks a little bit more Pythonic, where you have um, a method that operates on the string, and that method is now called format, and then you have value, value, value afterwards. So just to be clear, before, um, what I have here is some string, and that's basically the formatting string that I want, plus anything else inside that's not going to get formatted. This weird sort of percent sign, which doesn't look Pythonic at all. And then a tuple that comes after that. Um, here's how we do it now. Um, but as you'll see in the boot camp, we sort of uh, go back and forth between the different ways of doing these types of printing. On and now with these little curly brackets, on 0, comma, I feel curly bracket one, and I'm saying dot format, and I'm giving it not a tuple, I'm basically just giving it a, a set of arguments, and here we have Saturday groovy, on Saturday I feel groovy. What's happening here? Well, the formatting is saying, whenever you've got these little curly brackets, it's saying grab the first argument, that's what the zero says, grab, sorry, grab the second argument, that's what the number one says. So it's saying, oh, I'll pull Saturday into zero, and I'm going to pull uh, groovy into um, where it says the number one. If I don't actually give the, uh, the numbers here, um, it will wind up um, behaving the way we think it should. This is a little bit strange to me, just see a bunch of empty characters and not even say what it is that we want from that. Um, on zero, uh, one, um, uh, on zero, I feel one. Here's a basically almost identical to what we had on our first line, except we have a list and not a um, set of arguments. What's going to happen here? There's an error. And why is that? Well, because Python is expecting you to have this argument and you've given a list, so it only sees one argument where it's expecting to see two. It has no idea what to do with this one here. Um, this is OK. 
Although this this isn't really a nice thing to do, but um, because it's a little bit uh, a little bit subversive for somebody that's trying to read your code. On zero, I feel zero. So what's the zero um, argument to this format string? It's a list that says Saturday Groovy. On zero, I feel zero um, format um, Saturday Groovy. It's only going to grab the Saturday. Okay. So remember before when I said you know all these different ways of showing off math uh, uh, math dot pi math dot pi. I actually had to explicitly give it math.py, math.py, math.py. Now, if I know I just want to format math.py in a bunch of different ways, I can just give that as one argument and just keep referring to it um, in the string itself as a uh, curly bracket zero. So um, you can assign by um, argument position, which is the zeros and ones. Yeah? All of your examples are strings. You have to cast it to a string already. No, no, you won't have to. Um, we'll see. I think we'll all get to a couple of examples of that. Um, yeah, I will get on the next page. So now let's say that I'm going to have this really long string and I don't want to have to keep looking up. Maybe I've got a, a triple quote and it's three pages long and I want to replace a bunch of different places with uh, uh, you know, some, some variables that I don't know their answer until, until runtime. Maybe what you want to do is instead of saying in the zeroth place, I want to grab that thing. In the first place, I want to grab that thing. Now you can actually name um, the, uh, the variables that you want to pull in. So here, we're now giving it, um, a, a, again, a bunch of arguments, but now these look more like keywords. Desire equals fly me, place the moon. Desire to place, and instead of saying zero and one, I'm saying fly me the moon. I'm grabbing by name um, these different variables that I want to stick in there. Yeah. And you could have, in the, in the format parenthetical, you could have had place first and desire second. Yeah. Okay. You want to try that? Why? Well, no. But you don't have to try. Well, don't don't trust me. I'll cut the pace and make it easier. Okay. Um, and you want to say, uh, well, it's just I'll just change it in the string itself, right? Okay. Um, desire to place, or else I don't want to visit place. Fly me to the uh, and fly, desire equals fly me. Place equals moon. And you see that I'm grabbing twice. Um, place. Fly me to the moon, or else I won't visit the moon. Um, we don't have to actually give it a, yes? I was just to ask, can you predefine desire and place that, before? Yeah, that's what we're doing now. Oh. Yeah, so that's this line, where we're actually just going to create, uh, what type of um, variable is this, f? It's a dictionary, keyword desire, value place, uh, and then, sorry, value I want to take you, um, uh, key place, and value funky town. So desire place, and now you have to do this um, funny double star, which is essentially dereferencing the location of where this dictionary is. The only time we really have to think at all of the pointers. I want to take you to Funky Town. Yeah. So if you wrote before desire equals something, say a particular variable that you have a user can place put in, and place equals something before, then do you have to ever mention them again, or can you just say uh, the um, post desire to place on quote and then dot quote? So you want to create um, you want to create a variable called desire and see if we can just make use of it. Yeah. And then you want me to say something like um, desire. Yeah, and then dot format. And what am I going to put in here? Yeah, that's right. Can you redefine it without me calling it? Uh, no. No, you have to, it's looking for, it's basically looking for a key. I mean, I could do desire equals desire. Okay, so you have to do desire equals yeah. desire. Yeah. So the what? The apostrophe and won't. The apostrophe and won't. Um, what I would do is, so you want to do something like, um, you 
you want to do an apostrophe in there. There's two ways. You could do a backslash that. Um, or what I would do just to make the code a little bit more readable is have a single quote in there and make these double quotes. Okay. So here's some formatting, and basically the same sort of formatting paradigm from the previous way in which Python was doing string stuff. Um, more or less persists. It looks a little bit weirder here. So this is what I had before, where I had a percent sign 03.2, so it's giving me all the, um, all the uh, sec basically two places after the decimal place, and it's going to pad it out with some zeros. And I'm doing the same thing here, and what you notice is I have a colon, and then I have my format stuff after that. Um, when you, everything before the colon is where you're basically giving it the key to look up. So here I could have put a zero, but I just left that empty. And these are identical, so the strings that they're creating are identical. Um, here is where I've explicitly said, give me the zeroth, uh, the zeroth argument. So I'm going to grab out this um, shortened version of pi, and I'm going to format that. Um, now we grab the first one. So again, I've ignored the 42. So I've had that in there. I just haven't done anything with it, which is nice because if you have this huge dictionary of stuff, and you know that on one line you want to print some stuff out, on another line you want to print another stuff out, you can just keep on passing the same dictionary and only make use of the um, of the variables as you need as you need them. 42. Um, you can do binary numbers. So again, I'm not going to be able to go through all of these different formats. If you need it, you'll know where to find it. Um, uh, int, so it's a D. Hex is an X. Oc is a O. And bin is a B. And again, this is a sort of nicer way to do this um, instead of the way we're at it. Keep on saying math.py, math.py, math.py. Right, because I just keep grabbing the zero argument. Um, there's other stuff, I won't go into the details of all these different um, carrots and things, but here I want to actually pad it out with not um, white space, but perhaps I want to pad it out with some character, in this case pad this out with basically 11 characters in total, and um, then have a bunch of uh, stars around it. I can left justify with padding, right justify with padding, um, I don't know what that does. Oh, that's, um, Right, justify where um, I require that I have 11 characters. So it's not it's not exactly the same, um, especially this left and right justify stuff and the padding with different characters. That's sort of new. Um, but again, when you need it, you'll know where to find it. We won't have a lot of time to sort of get into the nitty gritty of this. But I want you to know that it's available. And it works on two dots. It works on 2.7. Definitely, it may even work at 2.7. 6.5 level. You may have to import something special to say use the new way of doing printing. But yeah, for all of you guys using 2.7, you're good to go. And this is the only way to do it in, uh, in, um, in 3. Uh, regular expressions. Um, those of you that know about regular expressions already sort of know all the syntax. Those that don't, there's no way I'll be able to, to teach all of that. The point is that Python has regular expressions, just very complex ways of doing string searches. So for instance, I can create more or less a compiled regular expression search through email. Remember that long thing that said check email? You can basically just find all the, uh, find all the emails that are valid, and that works. And then I get one of my bad emails, and I don't get anything back. So I'm not going to go into regular expressions. I'm just going to say that you can create these very long expressions that tell, that tell, uh, the, uh, that, that tell Python when you use this on a string, go and try to do the searching on this. And if it fails, don't give me anything back. If it succeeds, give me something back. You can get the string back itself or something else. Um, this is very powerful if you're parsing through lots of strings. You wouldn't typically do the, you know, look for the, um, you know, look for the dot, make sure there's at least one at sign or only one at sign. That's expressed through this crazy expression here. And you're not going to be tested on that. And by the way, I found out how you do regular expressions on whether something's a valid MasterCard or Visa. Do you know how, like, when you're typing in online and you have you like enter the thing in and put your number in, and it's like, no, you said this was a MasterCard. This is actually a Visa. 
there's a little JavaScript somewhere that's checking in the browser and it's running that regular expression on your number. It doesn't know whether how much money you have associated with that card, but there is a rubric that both of those companies have for um, basically uh, telling you how their whatever 12-digit number is valid or not. Okay, um, file I.O. You've already done some of this for your homework where you had to open up a file and read it in through uh, CSV uh, to rec. Um, but now, if you don't know what, you're, what you've got in the form of this file, or you do, and it's not in comma-separated format, it's perhaps something very different, but you want to be able to get into the internals of that, um, there is a uh, built-in called open and close. And it shouldn't be dot open and dot close. It should just be open and close. There, there is a way now, um, in fact, I think this is the only way in, in Python 3, um, using a module called IO. So you would say import IO. And then instead of saying open and close, you would say io.open or io.close. Don't worry about that. Um, for now, you can just open up a data file, and you tell it how you want to be looking at that data file. Um, R is for reading. W is for writing. You can do appending. You can open it up as in sort of uh, as an ASCII, so essentially as a view with an, um, uh, thinking that everything inside has ASCII characters in it. You can open it up as a binary. There's lots of different ways to do that. Um, R plus is just the read plus update. RB is a read as a binary stream. So what is, um, what is file uh, stream? It is a type file. Um, when I'm done with whatever I want to do with that file, I say file stream dot close. Um, likewise, I can write. So I can say, let's, let me open something called test.dat um, for writing. Um, I can do uh, basically write some string into that file. And you notice what you're doing is this F is now pointing to some place um, in memory. And when you close it, you know, you're making sure that you're doing all the right things of giving the right permissions and, and, um, and, uh, and, and making sure that it's happy on disk, et cetera. But the way to think about it is when you open up what's called a file buffer, you're basically pointing to the beginning of an empty file, in this case when I've done it, uh, when I've done it right. And what I've done is I've just written strings into that buffer. I can close that. Um, we can do import OS. OS.system, um, cat just shows me that. And instead of knowing exactly what I'm going to, instead of just hard coding in the name of the file, we'll just use a little bit of the string stuff here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially run at the command line, but with, from within Python, cat test.dat. You could remember in IPython, if you're just trying to see how well you're doing, and you've just written out a file, remember you could do the exclamation point, and then, and then whatever you want to do on the command line. But this is how you would do it just in pure Python. This is my first file I.O. Oh, and I had a zero at the end there. Anyone have any idea why that is? Yep, so the os.system returns to you whatever the result of it did here. It's capturing the, um, the exit code that comes out of that program, and that turned out to be zero, which is Unix's way of saying everything's fine. Um, all right, let's get a little bit, uh, a little bit more into the nitty gritty. Instead of just saying dot write, I can have a, an entire long list of uh, things I want to write out. And instead of writing line by line, I can just say write lines, and this will write lines for me. I can print that out, and I get the same. Thing. Yeah. What's that? Um, uh, that's a good question. I actually think you may may not need to have it. Let me let me just give that a try. So there it makes it seem like uh, you, you more or less don't need it. Um, so you do need it. If, let's see what happens if I don't put that in there. Oh, I can't do that because I already closed the file. 
so it doesn't let me write into a closed file. I guess that's good. Um, so do we need it? Yep. Write lines is really just a statement of write this whole list and just do the looping for me. Um, it's much faster if you've got a long, long list of stuff you want to write out. It's much, much faster um, to write it out using write lines than to just say, you know, do a list comprehension because all that stuff is happening for you at the C level if you say write lines. Um, the other, the other way in which I think about interacting with files is typically what you'll wind up doing in other um, programming languages is you'll like open up the file and then you'll sort of interact with that file and say some big loop, right? And then at the very end you close the file. What I usually wind up doing is I open the file, if it's not massive, I'll read it all into some, some buffer, I'll read it into some variable, and then I'll just close the file immediately, and then I'll just do all the stuff I need to do with the actual um, the variable itself. Another way to think about that in the context of writing is that let's say you're going to be writing the result of some long code that you uh, have been running. And it's, if you're pretty sure that that code isn't volatile, isn't going to break, and you don't need logging, you don't need sort of checkpoints, let's say you're just going to, you want to accumulate all of the things that you want to write into a file. What you might do is load up your own variable, your own list of what you would like to write, and then just at the very end, open up a file, do write lines, and close it rather than keep a file open for the whole time and in turn do your writing of the lines throughout your code. Um, there's read lines and read, uh, basically symmetric with uh, write and write lines. Um, so we can uh, open up some data, um, read it in, close it down, print it out. Um, if we said just uh, read, uh, so f dot read, that would mean that we're only going to read one line, um, and uh, it would wind up looking until it gets to a backslash n. Okay, we're going to play around with um, uh, another file which should be uh, on the website. It's called Tabify My CSV. Um, it's I think well named, and it has some doc strings in it. It tells you what it does. Um, essentially, we're going to wind up taking a uh, file in. We're going to write out another file, and we're going to more or less take it from being a comma-separated file to being a tab-separated file. So um, it's a small copy program, as it says, that turns CSV file into a tab file. All right, so let's um, step through this. First of all, how many arguments are there? Two arguments, and how many, how many uh, keywords? Yep, we got two. And so the default for ignore comments is true. And the comment characters, these are the ones that we might um, ignore, uh, are, uh, are these guys. We could add more if we wanted to and change that. So if not ospath.exists, what do you think that means? The file isn't there. Return and don't do anything. We could say we can give them something more close. Let's open up a file. And let's open up uh, another one that we're going to write to. Um, in lines, f dot uh, read lines, f dot close. You notice I just read it in and I closed it right away. So now in lines has all those lines. Out lines is now an empty list. Yeah. In lines is right. What do you think? Well, it's read lines and write lines was we wrote out uh, we wrote out a list with write lines. Read lines will give you back an array. And if it turns out there are no backslash ends, it will give you an array of length one with the whole, basically the whole buffer. Um, for L in the inline, so I'm going to now loop through all the uh, lines. If ignore comments, and the first element of that line is in the comment characters, uh, I'm going to wind up uh, appending it directly. So I'm, even if I have tabs and commas inside of those comments, I'm going to just ignore those and just faithfully reproduce those comments. And I'm just going to append that, uh, that string into my list of outlines. You notice I'm not writing each time on, into, the, um, into the buffer. That would actually incur a bit of a file I.O. Um, overhead. I'm just writing it into um, my uh, variable called outlines, my list. Otherwise, um, 
take that line and replace all the commas with backslash t's. And when I'm done, write the lines and close the output file. Yeah. No, read lines. No, read lines should give you um, a list back. Well, so let's see. We've got more. Oh, we've got more test data, right? Um, let me write out the test data. By the way, I'm pressing the up arrow. That's kind of nice. Um, IPython has uh, has some of the the um, read line stuff that you're used to if you're working in, say, a bash shell. And by the way, you can also do control R to search back into your history in IPython. So I can um, search for close. I just start to type in close and it finds the latest one. If I do R again, I get another another one. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Or test that, that. Okay, so that has a couple different lines on it. Um, and what are we gonna do? We're gonna say, O equals open test.dat. I want to read this in. O read lines. Okay, so it, it returned for me back a list. By the way, if I quit out of IPython, it didn't say, you've got files open, and it's not like I set up race conditions. One of the really nice things about Python that we haven't really spent any time talking about is all of its garbage collection, right? I had an open file and I just quit out of Python. And Python said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of all the stuff you've left open. All, all, of, your little, uh, all of your little pointers and things I'll deal with. So it's dealing with all that stuff for you and you don't really have to think about it. Um, so let's take a look at the Google share price. Um, you see it's got a comment on it um, and it's got a bunch of different uh, uh, numbers, it's a little bit similar to what you had before with your trends for your homework. Um, let me look at the output if I run um, this uh, Tabify on it. Let me get back where I expect. Okay. Um, a little bit more about file I.O. Um, one way you might think to copy one file to another would be to sort of open it all up, put it all into memory, and write it all out. Um, there are nice um, utility functions that you can use that do this very efficiently um, with low memory overhead that are that's very quick. SHUtil module is the thing that you want to look at if you're going to be doing lots of sort of file manipulation where you're moving things around within, uh, within your OS. Sometimes you need to build up a temporary file, and you want to make sure they don't just call it slash temp slash test dot dat. Because what if you have 10 versions of your code running at the same time and they're all sort of using the same thing. So you need essentially a random test file name and you can do that with a module called temp file. Again, as soon as you say, what I'm about to code, maybe somebody else in the world has done this over the last 10 years. There's probably something uh, within Python to do it. Temp file is, um, is a, is a built-in module for, um, uh, for Python and I, I often use it. So here I'm just gonna create a temp file. What is type of temp it is of type file. So I just get back essentially an open file pointing to somewhere. Um, if I wanna actually name that file, so, so if I wanna just write into that temporary file, do stuff with it, and then be done with it, and I don't care where it lives on memory and stuff, you would use temporary file. If you actually wanna name it so that you can actually look at it later, or actually pass the name of that file around to another function, you can do that as well. You can say how you want the file name to end. You can say where you want to stick the file in the form of, of the dir keyword. Um, you can say when I'm done um, with the file, as in when I close the file, whether I want Python to automatically delete it for me or I want to keep it around. And the prefix will be boot. And temp.name, which is an attribute of this, uh, of this uh, uh, file type, is something. And if you run this exact command um, right now in your own interpreter, you're going to get something very different, except the first four letters of this file will be boot, and the last uh, four characters will be .csv, because that's how we've told it uh, to behave. And it's going to put into this slash temp directory. So I can write um, 
I can write into that file if I'd like to immediately. So I'm going to basically create a comma-separated sep comma file uh, with a comment stock phrases of today's youth. For instance, what's up, OMG, LOL, BRB, Python, um, temp.close, and now I'll actually take a look at that file. Oh, and I got a zero, right, because I have the uh, OS system. Sometimes you don't actually want to write into a real file on disk. Perhaps you just want to write into something that behaves like a file so that you can pass it around across uh, your, uh, your code base. Um, and while you're sort of working in your runtime environment, that sort of object lives as if it was a file on disk, but it actually is just some place in memory. And string I.O. is used um, very often for this. It's handy for making file-like objects out of strings. And for those that are used to thinking about files as, um, as buffers, where you can sort of jump around to locations within the, in the buffer, things like seek, where you could go to the beginning or the end of the file buffer, that stuff all kind of works within string I.O. Even though you're not actually interacting with a real file, you're interacting with something that looks like a file to Python. Uh, but is actually just uh, some big chunk of memory somewhere. So import string IO, my file string IO, stock phrases of today's youth, et cetera. Um, uh, we can get what we've just written in. We can seek to the beginning of that file. We can do read lines on that file. I can close that file. And I can write to that file, except I closed it. So that's not good. So let me open it up again. I can seek to the second location of that. I can write silly inside of, starting at the second location, seek back to zero, read out what I got, and you see that I replaced um, stock with silly. Even string so this is not a string in the sense that you're actually, you're interacting with this as if it's a, a, a file and you're interacting with it as if it's a file that's open, that's in memory. So when I actually say, um, in, instead of saying silly, if I'd said supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, it would overwrite all the characters that are there, um, and it wouldn't make the whole thing larger. I always wanted to say that, but now I'm done. You retire. Um, C string IO is a faster implementation, um, a bit more memory efficient, but um, it's not uh, sort of cross-platform independent. Um, I believe it works on all Unix flavors and Mac. I think it's got some volatility um, with Windows. So typically what you'll wind up seeing if you are going to use um, uh, string I.O. is you'll see something, well, you'll see something basically where you, you have a way of saying, try to import C string I.O. If that doesn't work, just import string I.O. We'll show you an example of that um, in one or two modules. Another uh, useful um, uh, interaction that you need to do, obviously, is make calls and uh, have discussions with your, um, with your OS. And uh, I already showed you OS.system. That is not a preferred way to be doing things at the command line from within the Python interpreter. Um, instead, the preferred way is doing something called subprocess. And there's lots of different things you can do with subprocess. Essentially, the way that you think about your interaction with, um, the, uh, with the OS is that you're basically going to start up different processes. Sometimes you want to push stuff into that process as if you were sitting there at a terminal and typing stuff. Sometimes you want to receive things back from it, so you want to get the standard out from that. And sometimes you want to be getting the standard error. And all of those are considered sort of different streams from a Unix perspective. Um, but what you do is uh, you basically open a process, that's p open, and here I'm opening up ls, or if you're in Windows you would say dir. Um, I want to create the equivalent of a shell when I do this, and I want to um, have the standard out go to something called pipe. Um, I get a process ID, so if I want to watch how that process is going, I can, as you'll see, we'll be able to wait for that process to finish. It's got some process number, yours will be different when you run this. Um, I get a standard out, so p dot standard out dot read lines. I get all the results of what's in my directory. Um, if I want to run something called spam a lot, which is an executable that does not exist, um, I'm going to get the standard out and the standard error. 
and spam a lot, command not found. Okay? Um, you usually, if, especially if you got something that's going to run for more than you know a nanosecond, like an LS or something, perhaps you actually want to go off, do an email, check a web page, write some file, and then come back to the Python process. Um, you usually want to return basically uh, after you're done. So if I just say find everything with the dot uh, 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 a dot py at the end. Um, I can wait until that process is completed, and then I get my full listing out. If you don't wait, there's a chance that because you basically can return right back from the call to popen, you can actually get results back from the standard out um, before it's, this whole thing is completed. So if you want to wait until the process ends, um, you just do this uh, os.waitpid, because now I know the process ID of um, of, uh, of this process that I spawned off. Yes? So if you just do read lines, it's not going to make sure it waits until the process is done? It That's give you what's if you done. just said read, I would you typically if you're interacting and you don't know how many lines you're going to get back, I would just say read. And if it takes an hour to get it back and you just keep on looping through and you read every one minute, you'll just keep on building that up. But typically, if you want to interact with it that way, that's fine, right? Which is really nice because it means you could have an asynchronous discussion with some other process. Um, and Python could be actually acting as a surrogate for a person, for instance, by doing standard in and writing to standard in, which would then get taken up by the subprocess. Yeah? Um, I don't remember, but let's figure it out. I, I've never used it any other way. Um, you might, as Brad's saying, you might be able to pr uh, pass it a file handle. So sub process p open question mark. Um, I think the way we should do this is by looking at the uh, looking at the documentation. If we want to do that, we can do that. Oh, I'm not online. Um, the documentation on that gives lots of different types of examples of, of how to use subprocess. I've almost exclusively used it just to replace what I used to do with OS system. And there was something called popen2 and popen3. But this is more or less, I need to start up some other thing somewhere else. This is where Python comes in as a glue. I need to run stuff, get the results back, and just deal with it within Python. Um, but I think you can do very complicated interactions using subprocess. Okay, um, it's breakout time. You're going to build a command line utility file which copies the input file to another file. And it does crazy stuff to it. Reverses the ending of the file. Um, so if it was called josh.dat, it's copied to josh.tad. Uh, deletes every other line, changes every occurrence of the word love to hate, not to is, is to not, sets every number to half its original value, so if you see 3.14 and uh, you like 2, you should say something like 1.57 and you like 1, count the number of words astrology and physics, and we'll post uh, in a minute um, a file called le.info. Um, onto the onto the agenda site, um, but you can start coding this up um, just to get the whole infrastructure there. It's not there. Okay, Brad has posted it. <laughs> Any questions about that? This is a silly one, but it's just trying to get you used to dealing with um, reading and writing out and getting into files and messing around with strings. <laughs> 